It's time for another episode of the Collative Archives. Uh, these are the videos in which I take lots and lots of the notes and ideas that I've had for videos over the years, but I simply don't have enough time uh, to, to properly write and edit full videos on those subjects. Right, so I'm going to be working mainly from the computer screen here today because I took a lot of the notes that I had on these subjects and I, I typed a lot of them up. So I'll be referring to my notes there. Uh, the first one we have is what I call the Matrix Effect. Why modern action movies are so awful and why they look like video games and why they play out like video games. Uh, so uh, the reason I've called it the Matrix Effect is because I believe that the Matrix film, which was uh, incredibly original and powerful as a, a, an action film because of its very unusual plot scenario, I believe that the Matrix film forever changed action movies uh, in a bad way. And this isn't to say anything bad about the Matrix movie itself. It more says something bad about the other filmmakers and the studios and uh, how they misinterpreted uh, the Matrix's action scenes uh, and have ended up spoiling a lot of action movies since. So most action movies have been spoiled by this. So I've narrowed it down to two basic things, and that is parkour gravity defiance and robotic precision of violence. Now the second one also harps back to the Terminator. So you could also call that one the Terminator effect. I'll go into that in a minute. So the first thing about the parkour gravity defiance. So you had the Matrix movie which had this um, surrealist, almost dreamlike digital reality world uh, in which characters could fight it out physically and they could leap super high, they could do all kinds of superhero backflips, and um, they could take tons and tons of punches and kicks without taking any damage and stuff like that. Now, the thing about characters being able to take lots and lots of punches and kicks and uh, fall down steps without breaking bones and things like that, that did already exist in action movie cinema way before the Matrix film. Um, that stuff was, was present in uh, Walter Hill's The Warriors, which is a, an absolute classic movie, which I still love. And I think the action scenes in that film are incredibly well done. They're not realistic, but they're so stylish and engaging. It's, it's brilliant. Um, so you had all that going back in the day. I mean, the old martial arts movies from the 1970s and 80s would have people fighting it out. And they'd be punching and kicking each other for five, ten minutes of screen time. And nobody really ends up with any severe bruises. Nobody ends up with an eye that's like, like swollen out there or a broken jaw or teeth missing. They might end up with a cut lip or a little tiny bit of a bruise. But in reality, if people hit each other like that, they would be all mashed up to hell. And it would look it wouldn't look very nice on screen. So, yeah, we already had the injury resistance thing going on in cinema but the matrix provided uh, a, it provided a plot justification for a total disregard of gravity so characters can fall off buildings hit the ground and then just survive they can do huge slow motion precision uh, backflips and they can jump and dodge bullets they can jump in the air and fire guns in the air as they jump. That's become a big sort of a action movie uh, trope, a, um, a cliche. You know, I mean, when in reality does anybody ever leap in the air with two guns in hand and firing away at the same time? Um, and that also goes back to the, the John, uh, John Woo action films um, from Hong Kong. I can't remember if they predate The Matrix. They possibly do. But what The Matrix did is it took that parkour action insanity, the gravity-defying thing, which mainly used to be confined to kids' superhero films. You know, superheroes who can leap and jump like Spider-Man or can just fly like Superman. The Matrix film took that childish defiance of gravity and provided a storyline in which it would be acceptable to an adult audience to watch that kind of action scene. And as a result, you had these really cool, unique action scenes in The Matrix, um, which everybody loved. I mean, the story of the film was great, but the action scenes really stood out for, for that reason. And so, since then, what we seem to be getting time and time again is action movies trying to imitate the parkour defiance of The Matrix film 
whether the filmmakers realize they've been influenced by the Matrix or not, they're trying to imitate the gravity defiance parkour action scenes, but they don't have the plot justifications to suspend our disbelief. With the Matrix film, whenever anybody did anything that defied gravity, you could just say, oh, well, you know, they're in this computer world, so uh, the rules, uh, the physical rules of the normal physical world don't apply. And that's actually said in the film, and it works. Occasionally, other movies have come along that have, a, you know, a, just, a plot justification that kind of works in a similar way, like, uh, the, I think it was 2018, the movie Upgrade, which is a sci-fi action movie, which is very good and very underrated. If you haven't seen Upgrade from 2018, I do recommend that one. Um, that movie involved uh, parkour gravity defiance, not as severe as The Matrix, but it also involved precision violence, like computerized precision, where characters have a, an unbelievable, unbelievable ability to be physically precisely accurate in their violence in the way that a computer would. So Upgrade was very, very good, uh, but it had a plot justification that, that worked in that respect because a character had had a computerized brain implant that would take over and that would do the violence for him. But many times I've been watching these uh, action movies where there is no justification for a defiance of gravity. And so you have the characters jumping around and doing parkour and uh, in the middle of uh, fighting people and it becomes like a gymnastics display and for me it, it ruins action movies because I feel like I'm watching the Olympics you know I feel like I'm sat at the Olympics and there should be somebody on screen like a, a I don't know a woman in a bikini holding up a scorecard like they used to have <laughs> hey that's a 10 out of 10 parkour jump that was just done in this action scene you know, yeah, there should be scores coming up on screen from the judges for uh, you know which character has the, the best parkour jump. So for action movies to become good again and convincing again, I, I think this parkour action thing needs to be toned down, maybe not completely dropped. I mean, it's always kind of been there in action scenes uh, from what I remember. I mean, you go back to the old Buster Keaton films, the old black and white movies and the stunts he did. However, that was a real stunt guy doing the real thing, you know. But, you know, a good example of um, uh, an action scene that is uh, quite um, mostly convincing but doesn't involve this massive defiance of gravity is the police station breakout scene in the movie First Blood, you know, the first Rambo movie. Uh, I mean, that, that was halfway, you know, one guy takes on about six people, but it is Sylvester Stallone. He is very muscular and he's been trained uh, as a, you know, an expert uh, soldier in warfare. Uh, and so you can see this guy taking out, a, you know, three or four cops in one little fight scene, but he do, he's not bouncing off the fucking ceiling and doing massive rolls and, and jumping off the walls and stuff. You know, it's, that doesn't need to be there. So if you keep the, 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 um, the realism of gravity in the action scene, it makes a difference. This may seem like a really nitpicky thing, but I've just been seeing it so much in action movies, and I think it's a major problem. The other thing which I mentioned is the robo robotic precision of violence. And I think the movie that really kicked this off was the original Terminator. Everybody loved the Terminator character because he was so powerful and precise and... Uh, we all had like a fantasy of being as strong and precise and as efficient as the Terminator. That's part of why we love the character so much. And so, I mean, that, that was also present in the movie Robocop, although Robocop didn't have the parkour thing going on so much. And funnily enough, neither did the Terminator. Both of those robots were, were based on uh, precision violence rather than parkour. And Robocop was actually pretty sluggish moving. But yeah, it, it's it's like, a, a, especially that got expanded in Terminator 2. So you've got characters who look human, who have superhuman robotic factory precision in their violence. And that really caught, caught on. And it made the, the first two Terminator movies very special in terms of the action scenes, because we were able to see characters doing things that would be impossible for a real person to do. So that was unique and unusual. Uh, and then you, just like with the parkour thing, uh, you get other movies started coming along trying to have characters doing uh, extremely precise robotic precision uh, violence in situations where the script didn't justify that precision. Uh, and I think this is part of why superhero movies became so popular, and thankfully they're declining in popularity now. Uh, superhero movies became so popular simply because characters were able to defy gravity 
and were able to have super robotic precision. Um, but those movies are dying off now. And I think what filmmakers and the studios and the script writers, I think what they need to start doing is start looking at the real world. Uh, start looking at real world violence, how it really happens. Uh, and you know, try to incorporate that into movies. I mean, we don't want our action movies to be completely realistic because real life violence isn't a nice, enjoyable thing. It's horrible. I mean, you know, a single punch can cause a great deal of damage to a person's face and can ruin their life if they end up like, I don't know, they can end up with a broken jaw or a concussion or something like that. Um, you wouldn't really be able to call them action movies then because the, the violence wouldn't be enjoyable. But I think if um, action movies were, were sort of scripted again in order to fit in with the real world, how the real world physically works and become more physically convincing, then I think we could have great action movies again. Because for me, the best era for action movies is still the 1970s and 1980s because they weren't defying physical reality so much. Okay, the next subject I want to talk about is an email I received a few days ago um, from a journalist or former journalist. Um, he was responding to a video I made about uh, women's true crime gossip magazines. I think I did that video about maybe five months ago or something like that. Okay, so this guy's name is uh, Zachary Smith. He's a former journalist and um, I think he's, he might still be a journalist, but he's, he's had a few journalist jobs in his time. And yeah, he wrote to me about the, the subject of journalism and gave me some feedback on some things that I'd said about how the journalism field works. And he has given me permission to quote him. So I'm just going to read out his email here. Mr. Rager, in your February 2022 video, oh, I didn't know it was that long ago, uh, the insanity of true women's true crime gossip magazines media analysis, that was the title of the video, uh, you mentioned that news media tends to all look the same because publications copy and rehash stories from one another, making only superficial changes and additions. I spent one year working as a reporter, or more accurately a reporter in quotes, as in not really a reporter, for Forbes. Uh, when I applied to the job, the position was described to me as a traditional reporting job, researching stories, conducting interviews and so on. However, when the job started, I found my duties consisted almost entirely of mashing together reporting from other outlets, occasionally, very occasionally, supplemented with additional quotes, usually gathered by email. Okay. Workers were expected to turn around articles frequently on topics where they had little background knowledge in about 30 minutes. As a consequence, the articles were usually superficial and imprecise, if not outright inaccurate. Great attention was paid to making sure that we used different phrasing than the phrasing used in the articles we were drawing from in order to avoid legal liability. This work was all couched in a very pretentious way. We talked of pitching stories when what we were really doing was copying and pasting links to other people's stories on Slack and saying, let's do an article on this. The whole thing was like working at McDonald's, except it was embarrassingly well paid and we had the added benefit of flattering ourselves that we were practicing actual journalism instead of just cranking out a bunch of facile, thoughtless writing to gather clicks. All this to say, your perception of how the news media often operates is accurate. As you say, it's not a grand conspiracy, just the behaviour of companies more concerned with turning a profit than displaying originality or integrity. Thankfully, when it comes to smaller scale news outlets, this is less of an issue because there's usually no one else covering local events from whom to rehash. Take care, Zachary Smith. Pretty cool, eh? Uh, I mean, the way he describes uh, how that the cut and paste journalism works, well, I have talked about that in videos before, actually going back several years, but the way he describes it is even worse than the way I described it. We... Um, traded a few emails back and forth on this, so there's some other uh, things that he said that are worth quoting. He says, quote, I think a lot of big name publications are trading on prestige built up over decades, chaining out material that would immediately be identified as poorly written if it lacked the imprimatur of a Forbes or a Wall Street Journal. Imprimatur? I don't think I've heard that word before. Well, thanks, Zachary. You taught me a new word. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to go, gonna have to go and look that one up in a dictionary. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, to continue his quote, it's anyone's guess how long it will take for that prestige to erode completely, end quote. Okay, so there you go. I just thought I'd share that this little email exchange with you because um, I know I sometimes you know I I give opinions on things, and some of you are probably like, oh well, you know, that's just his opinion. How does he know it really works like that? And I did say in, in previous videos where I've mentioned about this subject that it's hard to tell how much of this stuff is going on because um, we aren't there in the boardrooms, and we, if we had some like hidden camera footage of boardroom meetings at these uh, big news media publications where they discuss what stories they're going to publish and uh, how they're going to publish them, then we would get a very strong insight into how their uh, uh, their thought process works in terms of what stories they, they cover and how they cover, the, cover them and why. Uh, but we don't have that. But, you know, this email was just a, a nice little bit of uh, backup uh, information uh, on that subject. Before we move on to the next subjects, folks, I'm going to do a shameless little ad for my offline sale material. There are some discount sets available on my website at around about, uh, I think they're 65% off. Uh, there's four sets. So if you follow the link in the video description to my site, the first one I'll just quickly read out. Uh, this includes uh, my two hour, 13 minute video on Hereditary, which is uh, Greatest Screen Villains, The Paymon Demon, a very detailed study of that, of that character. Um, there's another one on the Pazuzu demon in The Exorcist. There's a one-hour study of that character. There's the Haunted Biology of Hellraiser. That's 54 minutes. And there's my study of The Night of the Living Dead, which I called The Human Realities of The Night of the Living Dead. That's a 66-minute video. And there's uh, three other sets here. I think one of them, for those of you who are the Kubrick fans, there is one set which is Kubrick, which includes... Uh, a one hour, 36 minute video, Eyes Wide Shut and the Weinstein Effect. It's got my thoughts on Barry Lyndon video, which is 33 minutes. And it's got uh, the full version of my video, A Clockwork Orange, Alex the Nazi, that's 50 minutes. And my uh, one hour study of Kubrick's very first feature film, which very few people have seen, which is just called Fear and Desire. But it does give some insights into that, the early mindset of Kubrick when he, you know, I think he was in his early 20s when he made this film. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, an interesting one to look at in terms of the, the slow development of Kubrick's filmmaking skills and some of the themes that were present in his very first movie that started to pop up time and time again in his later movies. So you can get all those Kubrick films in one set there. And there's a couple of other sets, so follow the link in the video description for that. Before we carry on, I've got one other video um, which I produced recently. Now this is a very unusual one, it's called... The Illusion of Cubic Reality in Picasso's Artwork, 2001 Space Odyssey, Tron, remember that movie from 1982, and the Windows Operating System and the video game Minecraft. This is a 1 hour 43 minute video covering all of those topics as part of a long running um, psychological phenomena that's gone on over the last 120 years. Um, regarding how we humans have created this geometrical, cubic interpretation of reality, which is largely the basis of most of our scientific thinking and most of our academic thinking. Um, but it's actually an illusion. Um, <laughs> it might sound, might sound crazy. We've invented incredible things using this illusion, but reality is actually something extremely different to the, the geometrical map that we apply to it. Um, so yeah, it, it covers um, 2001, Windows, Minecraft, etc. Um, as examples of that, cultural examples of how cubic reality appeals to us humans. Uh, so yeah, you can get that one on my website as a digital download that has to be paid for. Or you can sign up to me on my Patreon page, which is also linked in the video description below. And you can get to watch it through there if you sign up as a monthly supporter. Okay, let's crack on with the rest of our subjects for this Collative Archives episode. Okay, the, the next uh, subject, uh, I wasn't really sure what to title this one. I know I did have some more notes about this somewhere, but I haven't been able to find them. But it was definitely a video I've been wanting to do for a long time. Um, I've just wrote here, News Think, or Beyond the News Box. That's the two titles that I gave. And basically, the subject matter is... Uh, is that most of us are, we, we operate psychologically in our perceptions of the world 
within a, a quite a limited sandbox of thought, which is set out for us mostly by the news media. So th this is this sandbox of news media thought. Uh, it basically, it operates like this: on any given day or week or month, um, the news media collectively cover a certain range of topics and they will prioritize certain things so at the moment everything is you know ukraine war uh, there might be some particular um, unusual murder case that might have happened or we've got like this missing submarine exploded submarine situation at the bottom of the ocean with the titanic i haven't even bothered reading up about that because i consider that to be such such a tiny tiny drop in the huge uh, ocean of daily events that are happening in the world. I haven't even bothered looking at it. So you get a range of subjects. Let's let's say you've got ten or twelve major subjects that the collective news media he here in uh, the West are, are covering, and it gives the impression that this is reality. You know, um, here's what's happening in the world today. Subject matter A, B, C, D, E, F, G, blah, 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 blah. These are the things that are happening in the world today. And we all think within that sandbox. And I've noticed that even the people who believe themselves to have stepped outside of the, uh, the news media uh, effect on their mindset, even they tend to be caught up in this. So even like, <laughs> like big sort of... Um, major conspiracy theory channels you know where they talk about how the news media lie so much even they are trapped in this thought sandbox that is set up by the news media um now i'm not saying this is a conspiracy i'm just saying this is a, a general psychological pattern that's happening across the board but the the reality is that the true world that we live in is so much more complex the news media doesn't even provide one thousandth of the coverage that is needed to, to understand how the world works and what is really going on. And I would even say that the, the major subjects that are being covered by the news media aren't actually the major things that are going on at all. I mean, at the moment, it's like, oh, the big thing that's happening in the world is the Ukraine-Russia situation, or is it a proxy war with the United States, which I, I think it is, basically. That I mean, that is presented in the news media as if it's the number one thing that we should all be concerned about in the world, but it's not. I mean, there's there's tons and tons of other things going on. You know, there's two hundred and fifty odd countries around the world. Each one has got thousands of things going on every day. There are little wars popping up here and there in different parts of the world. Um, war itself is not always necessarily. Uh, the big thing that is the most important, there's plenty of other things going on with economics, with psychology of the masses, with chemistry, biology. There's, there's tons and tons of things going on in the world. And so what I'm basically saying is don't let your perception of what is going on in the world be limited to this sandbox of what the news media is covering. And even if you disagree with the way the news media covers it, if you preoccupy yourself with thinking about what the news media is talking about, you are still operating in that sandbox, even if you disagree with the way the issues are covered. And so there is a huge, huge field of experiences, thoughts, reality that fall outside of that sandbox. And I recommend that you step outside that sandbox. Keep an eye on the sandbox because it's not that you should completely ignore it. Be aware of what the sandbox content is, but make sure to have a huge chunk of your mind paying attention to everything that's going on outside the sandbox. And start looking at other information that falls outside of the news media. There's tons and tons of think tank websites, academic websites, publishing all kinds of material all over the world uh, on all kinds of different subjects. And a lot of it is absolutely fascinating and is just as important as what the news media is covering. It's just a general thought there. Uh, well, news think means being trapped in that box. And I do find it so funny uh, that a lot of the people who think that they've stepped out of the um, news media hypnosis reality, um, those people are still operating in that, that sandbox of thought because the news media prompts them on what they are going to talk about. So they will obsessively go on and on about, say, um, trans issues. Uh, but trans issues only affect a very tiny portion of society. 
Um, and yet the news media makes out like it's one of the most important things in the world. And it isn't, frankly, because it just doesn't affect enough people uh, to be of major importance. It doesn't affect me. I've got nothing to do with it. I don't really care if somebody's trans. I couldn't really care less. So I feel no need to jump into the, the news media sandbox and start waffling on about trans issues all the time. Um, so yeah, you know, just think outside that box as much as you can. The next one, let's get on to some more film-related stuff. Okay, so I was watching uh, Back to the Future, uh, the, the first and second Back to the Future movies. I watched them with my daughter uh, in the last couple of weeks and really, really enjoyed them. I hadn't seen them for a long time. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring it up, and I'll just read out my notes here, um, why all why all young people should watch it, that's what I've written. I think Back to the Future, the first film especially, um, is very important psychologically and it should be viewed by all kids, even in today's generation. And the reason I've given for that is because in the 1980s, it presented to audiences the notion that their social trends are just one of many different eras of trends that have gone on over the years. So Back to the Future involves a time-traveling reality where um, Michael J. Fox's character, he lives in the 1980s, and he ends up traveling back in time to the 1950s and has to do all kinds of stuff there to make sure that his parents actually meet and get married so that he can actually be born. It's got a great plot. Um, but a lot of the film's humor and its um, intelligence comes from the comparison between the quite different um, cultural, social trends that were going on in the 1980s compared to the 1950s. So he goes back in time and suddenly he finds that a lot of the behavior is very different back then to the way it is in the 1980s. Um, and he finds that the, the kind of music that he liked to play in the 80s, a lot, a lot of um, uh, rock, hard rock, uh, veg and gone heavy metal, um, he tries playing that some of that music to people in the 1950s and they're like, what the fuck? So yeah, I mean, it's. I thought that movie was very, very, very good for showing young people in the audience that, hey, you know the social trends that you're going through now? It's just a trend. Look at how it was just 30 years ago, completely different. And so when you get older, it could be very, very different again. So this, this is the great social value that I see in the Back to the Future film, the first one. The second movie I really like as well. It's very inventive, but there's something missing in the second one. And that is... At the start of the movie, they showed a lot of the uh, technological progress in the future that they thought was going to happen. Or not necessarily that they thought that was going to happen, that might happen. And they wanted to make it fun and interesting in that respect. But when they showed the future, they didn't show the kinds of major social changes that you would expect might happen. Uh, if I remember rightly, um, the character goes ahead to the year 2015 um, from 1985, I think, yeah, yeah, I think that was the the the, um, the time difference, and 2015 in reality uh, has been psycho what was psychologically very very different to what was depicted in the Back to the Future movie. Not just the technological differences; we don't have hoverboards uh, and things like that. But yeah, I, I've noticed that a hell of a lot of science fiction, when it shows the future. It will show technological changes, usually involving holograms or flying things. There's usually flying cars. You, again, we go back to that gravity park or defiance thing I was talking about earlier in this video. The future usually involves gravity defiance and uh, convincing holograms, neither of which we've have particularly progressed uh, in that time. But science fiction movies set in the future don't usually show us major psychological and cultural changes uh, that are not technology-based. Uh, and I wish more science fiction would do this. I, I think I did mention this in a previous video. Uh, but yeah, the, the Back to the Future Part 2 movie, it lacked that, whereas the first film had it, where it compared the two generations and the different attitudes. So I really like that about the first Back to the Future movie. And if you've got kids, I highly recommend you show them that movie in order to clue them up. And I think it's even more powerful now because being that uh, youth culture is quite different now to, even to what it was back then, if you show somebody back to the future now, you're actually showing them two previous eras where behavior and thoughts and perception were very different to what they are now. So that's even more educational. 
so as time goes on, I can see that Back to the Future becomes more socially valuable. And I also had some notes here on it, which was, um, well, first of all, I didn't find the third movie in the trilogy very good. I didn't enjoy the plot. I saw it once on the cinema. I haven't watched it again. But I remember I didn't find the depiction of the Wild West to be convincing in Back to the Future 3. And so I didn't feel like I was being shown something that uh, is a convincing cultural difference to what we've got now. So that that was something I didn't like in the third movie. But I've also noted here that some movies and TV shows made today that are set in previous decades like the 1970s and 80s have those characters speak dialogue in accordance with today's verbal trends even though we have plenty of movies and TV shows from those decades as reference. And so the people who are writing these shows today are probably very young writers who really aren't familiar with the previous decades uh, that they're writing about in their, their scripts. So yeah, I'm, you know, I, I don't know if that made sense the way I'd wrote it out there, but yeah, I mean, I've seen modern day films and TV shows which depict decades um, in which I grew up, the 1970s and 80s, but they are a, a very, very inaccurate depiction. And they don't show the cultural attitudes of the time, and they don't show the language patterns of the time. There's a lot of language patterns going on today that weren't present back then. Uh, for example, you know, a lot of people have this thing where they sort of talk like this, they sort of inflected the top, you know, they, they take the end of the sentence and they inflect it up like that, you know. People didn't talk like that back then, but I will see modern TV shows and movies that depict the past and will show characters talking with that kind of vocal inflection, which wasn't actually there. And I don't believe there's any excuse for those kind of script and mistakes, because if you, you, you only have to watch movies and TV shows and TV interviews from back then uh, to realise that people didn't actually talk like that. Okay, next up, this is a short little bit on uh, the movie The Shining, or not specifically the movie itself, but regarding the production, history of The Shining, and some recent publications that have come out about it. Now, uh, Lee Uncrick, who was the director of Toy Story, I think you pronounce his name Uncrick, he's been researching The Shining for many, many years. I don't think he did it as far back as I did, because I started back in 2007. I started making videos on YouTube, film analysis videos back then, and I did cover some aspects of The Shining back then, um, I think the first one I ever did was mainly about the Native American themes in the film. And I did do some other videos at the time, like the spatial awareness thing uh, with the sets. Uh, now, Lee Uncrick, as far as I know, around about maybe, I think it was 2011-ish, something like that, he set up a website called Overlook Hotel, and he was collecting uh, production materials, searching for it everywhere. He, he describes himself as being obsessed with the film. And it was a good website. It's still up. But he was posting a lot of interest and background information about the production, but he wasn't offering any interpretations of the meaning of the film. Now, he's taken all of his gathered research from over the last 12 years or so about the film, and he's published this quite expensive box set. It does look like a really good box set, containing tons and tons of background information that hasn't been seen publicly before, has not been published about before. And it looks like a really good box set. It's quite expensive. I think it's $1,500 at the moment. Now, I was considering actually paying that to get this box set. And the reason I'm not going to do it, and I haven't ruled out getting it, uh, I, I, I think I probably will wait for the price to go down. I mean, I can afford to get it at the moment, but I don't want to waste my money. The reason I'm not buying it at the moment, especially at that price, is because there's an issue to do with the prop in the movie called Jack's Scrapbook. I've talked about this before. I saw the actual Jack's Scrapbook prop at the Stanley Kubrick archives in London. I went down there and I think I saw it a couple of times. I spent some time going through it and I took a lot of notes. And as I've mentioned in my, my shining analysis uh, called Kubrick's Gold Story, that scrap uh, prop book, it confirmed as far as I was concerned, the... The, the theme in the movie of America being taken off the gold standard by the the, the, uh, the Federal Reserve bankers. I talked about that before. I've done videos about that before. And some people are like, oh, you're just a conspiracy theorist, well, which is a stupid response because America did get taken off the gold standard. The banks did do that. 
And um, there were a lot of controversies back then about the Federal Reserve, how it was set up and things like that. The, this isn't um, conspiracy theory. This is true history in America. The, America was taken off the gold standard and it, um, people were barred from owning gold. I can't remember what year that happened, but people were told you're not allowed to own gold. That was a big controversial thing. And I think it was in the 1970s that that law was finally lifted and people were allowed to own gold again. Pretty sinister economic aspect of American history. And The Shining movie has this as a theme. And I talked about it before in terms of there's a gold room in the film, which was not in the, the source novel by Stephen King. And there were other clues, such as in the framed photo of Jack Nicholson at the end of the film. Uh, you have various characters around Jack who some of them are actually key figures within the Federal Reserve banking system from back in the day. And I identified quite, quite a few of them. Benjamin Strong Jr. was a prominent one. He is very clearly there uh, in the photo. And the original photo that, that, that was used, Jack Nicholson was um, sort of cut and paste into this photo and airbrushed in. And I spoke to the artist who did the airbrushing and she doesn't know where the original photo came from. She said she thought it came from a BBC archive photo, but I haven't been able to um, search and get a copy of that. And the BBC, I contacted them to try and have a look in their archives for this photo to see if there was a copy anywhere. And they said to me, well, you're not a, an official journalist, so we can't let you in. <laughs> we can't let you have a look, which I think is stupid. Um, anyone can be a journalist, by the way. Anybody can do research. Whether you're going to be any good at it is another matter. Um, but anyway, so I was unable to chase that up. Now, the reason I bring up this Jack Scrapbook prop here is because in um, this box set of Shining Materials that's been released at quite an expensive price, but you do get a lot of material there. One of the books in there is called Jack's Scrapbook. And it's not the actual Jack Scrapbook prop that I saw in the, the archives. When I say it's not the actual one, I don't mean that the... the <laughs> Um, it's not the original one in terms of the, the physical original. I mean that the content of this Jack Scrapbook prop that you get in this set does not match up with the one that I saw in the archives. Now, Liam Crook said in a recent um, speech that he gave, somebody sent me a video of it. He gave a, um, uh, he gave a speech to an audience and he was talking about the content of the book. And... He said near the end of the video that the the original Jack Scrapbook prop no longer exists. And I was like, what the hell is he talking about? At the upper level of the box is an oversized scrapbook. Our scrapbook was, of course, inspired by the same scrapbook that Kubrick filmed and then abandoned. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the actual prop scrapbook that Kubrick filmed no longer exists. So using a combination of remnants left behind in the archive, as well as my own imagination, I created all of these scrapbook pages myself. Because I saw it at the archives twice when I was there. And I sat there and it was a huge thing like that. It was massive. And I sat there and I went through it. And I spent about half an hour each time, I think. And at one point, I took tons of notes writing down uh, what was in there. And it was basically a huge collection of old newspaper articles. I don't know how many of them were real articles, how many of them were fakes. But they were all articles from the 1920s and 30s mostly, but there were some articles that came later as well. And the subject matter of the articles from what I saw, and I did go through most of the book, was mostly World War I and II articles, which doesn't bear any relation at all to the surface plot of the Shining film or novel. I've argued for years that The Shining movie is partially about the history of America and the genocide of Native Americans and the gold standard issue as well. And in this Jack Scrapbook prop, there were tons and tons of articles about the Federal Reserve, about gold standard, uh, controversies around uh, gold ownership and um, Nazis shifting gold to Switzerland and to other places and things like that. There's tons of that stuff. And there was a lot of articles in the book about uh, low-level crime that had occurred in the 1920s and 30s. 
And some of it was witchcraft trials that had gone on, uh, quite sinister, low-level crimes. Um, all of that stuff mixed in with these larger stories about economic issues with America. That's the Jack Scrapbook that prop that I saw. I took lots of notes, and I wasn't sure whether these article clippings that had been cut out from old newspapers whether and put in the book. I didn't know if they were real or whether they'd been made up. It would have taken a lot of effort to make them up for the book. And so I took lots of notes on the details of some of the, the newspaper clippings and I started searching them online and I found that many of the stories were actually true. I was able to find the names of specific people who were written about in some of these stories and I was able to find other um historical documents and uh, newspaper stories that were actually you know real newspaper stories that were written about those very same subjects and written with the same kinds of details so i suspect i believe that at least some of the newspaper clippings that were in the jack scrapbook uh, that i saw at the archives were real and um some of them may have been faked now this is quite an, this is quite interesting because liam crick has said that that prop no longer exists now i don't know if he's actually seen the original one but the reason i bring this up is because in his set which is released by tashin and by the way i've bought a number of tashin books on kubrick and they've been excellent they've all been worth my money but in this set there is a book included called jack scrapbook but it's not a copy of the original scrapbook it's a new scrapbook that has been made up by Lee Uncrick. And he says in the video presentation that I saw that he has taken lots and lots of the research materials and uh, on set photos and stuff that he collected and he constructed his own scrapbook. And that's the version that you get in this box set. Now, I, I kind of consider that to be a bit of a disservice to the buyer because I think some people are going to be buying this set thinking that they're getting a copy of the actual Jack Scrapbook prop that was there um, when the film was made and that is not what you're getting in this set and that's the main reason why I've not bought this set and I will probably wait for the price to become much lower before I even bother. Now the version that you get um, which Leon Crick has um, constructed his own version it might be very good. It probably contains a load of interest and fascinating bits of information. But I think it's really important that people know that that is not the original Jack Scrapbook prop. And it's interesting that he says that, that prop, uh, scrap, the original scrapbook no longer exists, is not there. I don't know why he's saying that because I went back because I was sure I'd seen him write about it on his own site many years ago. So I went to his site and I looked back through it again. And uh, it didn't take long to find. He did actually cover it. Okay, and here's the page. Okay, so as you can see, there's a picture of the, the scrapbook. And I'm pretty sure that's the one I saw. And you see this picture here. That looks exactly like what I saw. And I actually specifically remember seeing this page as well. Um, I'm pretty sure I took notes on some of those articles that are on that page. So that is a photo of the real Jack Scrapbook prop that I saw in the archives which Leon Crick now says doesn't, doesn't exist. And yet, on uh, his site, and I think this was posted around 2012 or 2013, and yet on his site, he's got this, uh, this little write-up here with two pictures of the scrapbook prop. I don't know where he got the pictures. And let's have a little read of the, um, the write-up there. The scrapbook is filled with yellowed newspaper clippings chronicling sordid events from the Overlook Hotel's past as well as violent crimes in the Colorado area. Now, that's not what I saw. When I saw the book, it contained stuff mainly about American history with World War II and the gold standard. There may have been some stuff in there that was along the lines of what he's just said, but most of the book was about real historical events. His page continues... One page bears the handwritten phrase, and they took his balls with them, a line paraphrase from Stephen King's novel. Many of the articles of the scrapbook were written by journalist and Alexander Walker. Walker wrote for the Evening Standard and was also a friend of Kubrick's. Kubrick gave Walker copies of the Rocky Mountain News and other local Colorado newspapers on microfilm, along with a microfilm reader, and had Walker study the language and details of real articles so he could compose fictitious articles for the scrapbook. 
Now that's interesting. I don't know where Lee Unkrich got that information. Um, it's interesting. Unfortunately, this uh, film critic, Alexander Walker, who was apparently a friend of Kubrick's, unfortunately he died in 2003, so I can't email him and ask him. <laughs> it's so annoying that so many people have died from that production now and it's hard to track things down. So yeah, that, that's what Leon Crick claims about this. Um, I don't know if he spoke to uh, Alexander Walker or not. He continues, This scrapbook figures prominently in the novel of The Shining, though it appears very little in the film. A number of sequences were shot with the scrapbook, and I, I know this from other sources that I've come across, including a scene where Jack finds it mysteriously sitting on his writing table and a later scene where Jack shows the scrapbook to Wendy. Both scenes were deleted from the finished film. And it says at the bottom, original scrapbook stored in the Stanley Kubrick archive in London. But yet in this recent presentation, he says that the scrapbook no longer exists. So I don't know why he said that. But anyway, there's always something weird and mysterious going on with The Shining. So I just thought I'd bring that up. I do think it's important. I think, I think it's a bad bit of marketing that's been done uh, with this this um, production history uh, book collection thing that, 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 that Leon Crick has put out in conjunction with Tashin. And as far as no, I know, he's had the uh, cooperation of the, uh, the Kubrick estate to do this. And when I say the Kubrick estate, it basically means uh, Jan Harlan, his um, brother-in-law, who was executive producer of the, most of his films, um, and his uh, widowed wife, Christiane. They are the Kubrick estate, as far as I know. So he's had their cooperation. So I, I think it's a disservice, and I find it a little bit disappointing that a fake version of the scrap the scrapbook has been put out that doesn't match at all with the original one that I saw in the archives. And as I've just shown you on the Uncrick site, he had written himself that the, the book did actually exist. So has this scrapbook now being removed from the archive i'm assuming it possibly has if leon crick's saying it no longer exists why has it been withdrawn from the archive did it reveal too much about the hidden themes of the movie uh, i think it's a shame to withdraw it if that's what's happened uh, i haven't been back down to the archives for years myself and one of the reasons i stopped going is because i was finding a lot of great stuff while i was there and at one point, I wanted to make a new video about um, some particular subject. I, I think it was something to do, with, to do with the poster designs for A Clockwork Orange or The Shining. There was lots of alternate poster designs uh, in the archives, uh, various sketches, hundreds of them, uh, poster designs, which very much fitted in with the themes of the film that I've talked about for years. And I tried to get permission from the archives to publish just a small number of those as part of a new video. And the guy who was curating there, um, I think, I don't know if he's still a curator, but he was back then. Let me just check. Yeah, I can't find the guy. I, I, th I think there was a guy called Richard, who was quite a young guy who was curating there at the time. And uh, I emailed Richard and he was very helpful when I was there. Um, I asked him, you know, I was trying to find certain things to do with certain aspects of the production. Some things he knew about and some things he didn't. And, but he was able to give me some really good information in places and point me to the right boxes to look in. And, um, well, I, I emailed Richard asking him, you know, can you forward to the copyright holders? I'd like to get copies of a few of these things. And he came back to me a short while later and he said, oh, sorry, your, your request has been refused. Um, I wasn't allowed to get any photocopies and I said to him oh okay is there any reason given he said oh, there's no reason given and I asked him can you tell me who's refused is it Warner Brothers themselves have they got copyright and somebody there because I'd like to be able to contact them and explain to them why I'm asking for the copyright permissions um, and to find out which items uh, they have an issue with but he said that he couldn't even tell me who had denied permission so I don't know if it was the Kubrick estate or Warner Brothers or somebody else so for that reason, I was very disappointed at the lack of communication about uh, the process of trying to get permission um, to, to get copies of some of these items in the archives. So I thought, well, if you're only going to let me look and take notes, but you're not going to let me actually ever take any photocopies of anything, then there's not really much point in me coming back anymore. So I haven't been down there since. 
Okay, so yeah, that's that issue. Actually, that took a little bit longer to outline than I thought. So yeah, yeah, this uh, Jack's scrapbook prop is quite an interesting mystery regarding the film. And uh, it's now a mystery regarding what's going on there at the Kubrick archives. Okay, another subject matter. Okay, so um, I've had in mind for a while to talk about the modern directors who I actually have uh, decent or high hopes for in terms of what they might make in the future. There are a handful of uh, film directors, filmmakers, who I believe have the, the potential to be doing a lot of great stuff in the future if they can get the budgets and they, if they get the creative freedom to do it. The first is uh, Justin Kerzel. Uh, he directed the movie Snowtown, which I've talked about quite a few times before. He's done several other films since and uh, directed some smaller things, I think some episodes of things. But I did watch his 2019 movie called The True History of the Kelly Gang. That one was decent enough. It was okay. I didn't find it nearly as engaging as Snowtown, uh, but it was decent. But then I watched... Um, a movie made in 2021 called Nitram, which is about a, a, a true life spree killer in Australia, you know, shot and killed loads of people, kids and everything. Uh, it's a, a movie about him, how he grew up and his motives and things like that. I thought that was a really, really good, powerful film. So I've got a lot of high hopes for Justin Kerzel. He manages to direct in a style that avoids a lot of the pretentious tropes that go on with a lot of other movies today. He has good downplayed acting. He seems to know how to make dramatic statements without them being either too obvious or too hidden. Uh, he's very, very good, so I will watch anything that he puts out at the moment. He's possibly my favourite director to come out in the last, like, 15 years. The next one, and I've given tons of praise to this movie as well, is... Ari Aster for his movie Hereditary, which I absolutely loved. I thought that was incredibly deep film, very well written, very well directed and all the rest of it. I didn't like his second movie, Midsummer so much. His direction was okay, but I thought the story and script were quite poor uh, compared to Hereditary. And I don't actually really blame him so much for that because he'd taken on that project before Hereditary was released. And as he revealed in some interviews, he didn't know that Hereditary was going to be so well received. Um, and if it had been so well received, he probably wouldn't have done the Midsummer Project. I think he would have gone and made something that was more along, along the lines of what he personally wanted to make. Now, so he's done this movie called Bo is Afraid, which I haven't seen yet. Uh, it looks good from the trailer. You know, it, I've heard mixed things about it, but then I heard mixed things about Hereditary. I suspect I'm going to like it. But yeah, I've definitely got high hopes for him, even though I didn't like Midsummer, And even if I don't like Bo is Afraid, just the fact that he made Hereditary, I will check out anything else that he does in the future. The next director who I will watch anything that they put out because he's done so much good stuff already is S. Craig Zahler. His directorial debut movie of, uh, was Bone Tomahawk with uh, Kurt Russell. It was sort of a, a western with a kind of slightly supernatural uh, overtone. I quite like that one. Some people say it's his best film. I don't think it is. I much more enjoyed the follow-up movie, which was uh, Brawl and Cell Block 99. And then I absolutely loved the next one after that, which is called Dragged Across Concrete. He's a really good writer and a really good director. And he's willing to do things in his movies that go against the grain. He's willing to be controversial. He's willing to book the trends. And I suspect this is part of why um, a lot of the... Uh, the film critics with their ideological biases don't like him and try to character assassinate him in his movies that's been happening a lot but yet he's been making movies that blow away the quality of most Hollywood movies better stories, better acting uh, just better movies all round so yeah I'll watch anything that he does he's very good uh, the, I suspect that he may not get any decent budgets uh, for big movies in the future. Although I did see an interview with him where he said that the reason he's not getting the big budgets is because he won't make a movie unless he's got a final cut. And um, a lot of the big studios don't like that, so they probably won't touch him. Especially for the fact that his films are so violent as well. They might be worried that, oh, you know, he's going to create something that's too violent to market. The next one is... Uh, a director who probably the vast majority you've never heard of, but you should hear of, is this fellow called Henry Dunham. 
Now, as far as I know, he's just done this one really good, very low budget movie called The Standoff at Sparrow Creek. I guess you could say it's sort of a thriller, psychological thriller. It's about a, a bunch of guys who are like preppers. They're armed to the teeth with guns and they're prepared for a fight against the government. And the, there's a, a complex plot that goes on with there with a lot of infiltration and inf intrigue and stuff like that. It's really good. Great story. Good direction from him. Good cast. I think it only cost $150,000 to make. And when I watched it, I was like, this felt like when I was watching Reservoir Dogs when that, when that movie came out. Tarantino was a fresh film voice on the market back then. And he made this awesome first movie. And when I watched the standoff at Sparrow Creek, I got that same kind of feeling about the writer-director, Henry Dunham, that I got about Tarantino. Whereas Tarantino is extremely violent, um, this movie, Standoff at Sparrow Creek, doesn't um, go for excessive violence. It just concentrates on characters and dialogue and plot scenarios, and it's very, very good. The one thing that I disliked a little bit about the film is that a lot of the dialogue was too fast to follow. It was spoken and edited in a way that was really fast. And I'm like, hang on, hang on, can you give me two seconds between the lines there just for me to just process what was just said because there was a lot of implications there. So that was a slight problem. Um, but other than that, I thoroughly enjoyed the film. I did not expect a twist at the end at all. Uh, yeah, I think this guy needs to have money thrown at him by the studios to make decent movies, and he needs to be given the creative freedom. Now, that was 2018 that Standoff at Sparrow Creek came out, and as far as I know, the film hasn't been attacked as being any kind of um, unsavoury film that the critics disapprove of. I think it got uh, some decent reviews. Uh, but for some reason, this guy has not been given any budgets, as far as I know, and hasn't made any more movies I don't know what's going on with that, but yeah, keep a look out for Henry Dunham. And I'm giving a shout out to the studios. Any of you work for a studio, get this guy on board, get him to write some scripts, give him the chance to direct again. He's great. Actually, you know what? Just just as I finished there, I, I did a quick search and um, I found out that Henry Dunham does have a new movie in the works called Division Zero. He's currently writing and directing that. And there was a report from May 2022 he was working on that film, so I look forward to that. If he's writing and if he's writing and directing, great, you know, I'll watch it. So that's good. So he hasn't disappeared. The next director and female director, way well, you don't get many female directors, but this one I really like. Um, well, I've only seen the one movie of hers, and it was very good. Her name's Jennifer Kent, and she made the horror movie The Babadook, which was very very good. It was definitely a cut above most modern horror movies. Good director, and she wrote it, and I got the impression there was some very personal themes put in that film. She has done another movie in 2018 called The Nightingale, which I haven't watched yet. I'm not even sure what it's about, but given the strength of the Babadook, I'd be interested to see whatever else she comes up with in the future. Another one, um, and again, this is based on one movie that I've seen of his that I really liked, is a director, a British director called Christopher Smith, and he made this uh, sort of psychological horror movie called Triangle. And that was in 2009. Uh, Triangle is really good. And not many people have heard of this movie. But if you get a chance, give this movie a watch. It's, uh, it's unusual. It's different. I don't think it's a mega classic. But it's certainly very good and had me guessing. And it was well directed and well written. I did watch his follow-up movie after that, which was called Black Death. And I didn't like Black Death at all. Um, I'm not even sure what the hell he was trying to get at with this that movie, but I, I wasn't into it. He's made a handful of other movies since then as writer and director, but I, you know what? I haven't actually seen them. I didn't even know he'd made these. He made one called Get Santa, a comedy film. Oh, actually, yeah, he did this. Uh, he directed this other movie called The Banishing, which uh, he didn't write. I started watching that with my girlfriend, and it was we weren't really into it. I think we watched about maybe half an hour of it maybe 40 minutes and we were kind of bored and we didn't bother watching the rest so it, yeah it didn't really do it for us um, and he's made another one since then called Consecration which has just come out this year apparently it's got bad reviews on Rotten Tomatoes but uh, I don't really trust the critical reviews these days anyway I mean uh, pff, stuff tends to get upvoted or downvoted by critics for the most ridiculous reasons usually ideological ones uh, so yeah, I haven't seen that one. But yeah, I, 
it doesn't look like his other films are making a big impact, but Triangle from 2009 was excellent. And on that basis, I'll be keeping an eye out for any, anything else he does. And I may actually watch that movie, Consecration. And the last one on my list is the Safdie brothers. Uh, they did the movie Uncut Gems, which was really good. And they did another one before that starring Robert Pattinson called Good Time. And that was excellent as well. I don't consider either of those to be mega classics, but they're definitely well worth a watch and have motivated me to take an interest in anything else that the Safdie brothers make. So let's just have a, a quick look at what else they're doing. Well, it looks like Uncut Gems was the last one that they did. Mm, I'm not sure about this. They're talking about uh, they might do a remake of 48 Hours. I wouldn't even bother. 48 Hours, Walter Hill's scripting and direction was amazing. And I don't think you're going to find anyone who's going to beat the performances of um, Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte in that film. They were just perfectly matched. Why remake a movie that is so damned good. Remake a, remake a crap film. Okay, that's good. They told AV Club that the film was still being made, but it's not going to be a remake. Good. Don't touch 48 Hours. It's a mega classic. Okay, it would be interesting to see what you know, if they could do a good action film, because there's just so, many, uh, so, so few filmmakers around today who seem to make good action films. Uh, okay, so that's my list of the current filmmakers... Uh, filmmakers who've come out in the last like 10 or 15 years whose work I actually really look forward to and uh, recommend you check out. So it's Justin Kerzel, Ari Aster, S. Craig Zahler, uh, and I would say S. Craig Zahler has been the most consistent good filmmaker out of this bunch. Uh, Henry Dunham, but he's only done one movie, Jennifer Kent, Christopher Smith, and the Safdie Brothers. Those are all directors that I recommend you check out and who I'm checking out at whatever they do in the future. Okay.